Thank you for joining. We'll probably have a few more coming in here and there. My name is Max Gelvan. I'm a, an associate with the Comrass Company out of Miami Beach, Florida. We specialize in investment sales and landlord and tenant reps, specifically in and around the Miami area. Our next dynamic symposium takes a look at the state of the retail investment market, moderated by Philip C. Rosen. Would you mind raising your hand? It's me. Then we have, <laughs> then we have Greg Mattis, managing director at, of investment sales at Franklin Street. We have Michael Genora, principal investor of Genora Realty and Management. And lastly, we have Joshua Lat Lattle. Close. Ladle? Ladle. Ladle. Yeah, close. Ah. Anywho, he's the Vice President of Acquisitions at Global Fund Investments. Now, here's Phil Rosen to start us off. All right, thank you for the intros. We got the, uh, I think we, we got the order right. Do you think we need the microphones here? I don't what know. What do you think? Do. Yes. Yes. You need them? Okay. Oh, I forgot Steve was here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, how many students do we have here? All right, so we got a little student's row there. You guys should sit in the front row. <laughs> All right, so thanks for coming, everybody. And so uh, what we're going to do today, we were going to really break this into two parts, but I think we'll mesh them together. First thing we were going to do is really talk about the life cycle of a deal, but there's a lot of veterans in here who probably would not off during that. So I think what we're going to do is we'll kind of weave into what we do, sort of how deals start from sourcing the deals all the way through watching the sausage get made and really then closing on the deal. And then the most anticlimactic part is actually managing it. So um, I think we'll talk through that and um, you know, feel free to ask questions. Right? There's no question that I can't promise you we won't laugh at you for, but seriously, ask questions, okay? Uh, so what we'll talk about today is uh, really the state of the market. We've got three really dynamic people up here who really see deals uh, differently. Greg is a broker, um, and uh, Michael, you really start to finish on your, on your deals and manage them as well. And then you really are more on the underwriting part, Josh. So yeah. uh, I think you get different perspective. And then I'm a transactional real estate lawyer, so I represent clients when they're buying and selling, uh, um, when they're leasing, uh, so really, and developing. So really, you've got really what happens on transactions like this, the only person we're missing, uh, someone from capital markets, right? And so you're really going to get the full perspective as to what's happening in the market. And so, you know, the question that I like to ask people all the time is, you know, what are you seeing out there, right? And that's sort of a trick question because it depends really what asset class are you talking about, what geography are you talking about? And so maybe, Greg, you could start off by telling us what are you seeing in retail? Because uh, I think it's probably the most pertinent to, to everybody in the room. Just talk about what you're seeing top to bottom. And then this is really going to be more of a conversation. Yeah, so, you know, in terms of retail right now, it's, it's uh, the tale of two ends. You know, when the tale of two ends for me are large deals versus small deals. You know, the larger deals in the marketplace, you know, for the last couple of years have been really good. You know, a lot of us in the brokerage business um, have been able to broker large transactions and the financing capital markets has been very available to do those deals. And as you know, I always tell people last year was the best year, you know, of my life as a broker, but the worst fourth quarter of my life. And the fourth quarter, as, as we start to see the, you know, the government pull back on rates, you know, all those large commissions, all those large deals became... Um, became challenges because you couldn't make the numbers work. Uh, and so a lot of those deals have now fallen apart and a lot of sellers have, you know, not come to the market or not adjusted to where that pricing is. On the other end of the spectrum, the demand for high quality retail, you know, is, is, is in heavy demand. You know, a lot of people don't know, but, you know, when we got hit by those major hurricanes, they extended the dates for people's 1031 exchanges. Well, a lot of those dates are coming due and a lot of those people with exchange money are not versed in, let's say, managing property like Michael uh, or, or really doing <coughs> rehab work. They want to buy a high-quality deal with national tenants. Well, there's no inventory. You know, those owners built those to cap rates that people aren't going to pay. So what's really happened is, you know, we're seeing, as the year, you know, popped out here in January, um, cap rates have held up. You know, we're, 
we're selling a CVS in Doral right now for, you know, four and three quarter cap. You know, people are like, you're crazy, Greg. I'm like, yeah, we've got five offers behind the guy that's buying it. And the buyer basically identified our deal and one other deal for his total of $13 million. Mine's like about seven, two or seven, three. And he basically told me, if we don't close on your building, my guy's, my guy's screwed. Cash? Cash. Yeah. No debt. You know, no, you know, and no fight over the price either. I mean, we, you know, we fought a little bit over the price, but, you know, um, and then there's buyers behind that now because of what's going on in exchanges. So the demand for high quality stuff um, is there. I had a conversation with another exchange buyer out of California. Greg, I really want national tenants. What do you have? You know, I opened up, you know, the Internet to look and see what's out there called five or six of them brokers that I have the best relationships with, uh, which, uh, you know, you, you know, you guys know a lot of them and, and the same conversation, I've got nothing, that deal's under contract, all at really aggressive cap rates. So I wouldn't assume, a lot of people assume that the, because rates went up, that the market is not strong. The market is still strong because a lot of that money is still flowing through 1031 exchanges. Um, so. But are all those buyers that had the offers, the backup offers, are they all cash too? Like not necessarily. Not, the sub, not you know, necessarily. No, I mean they're they're most mostly buyers in exchanges. You know, putting up fifty or sixty percent debt. People are going to pay top of the market for a high quality deal, or generally putting down more money. You know, um, but I think what's starting to happen is on those larger deals, the sellers are starting to get more realistic about their pricing. And, but I think we're probably three to six months away from 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 those numbers. So you're an owner, right? You're an operator. Yes. What are you? What are you seeing out there? Is are you seeing what Greg is seeing? Yeah, we're, we're seeing pretty much the same stuff. Greg seeing the, you know, single tenant smaller deals are still trading at high cap rates and and they're transacting. The larger stuff that requires financing, it seems like a lot of the sellers aren't ready to to lower the price to take into effect the fact that the buyer is going to be paying a couple percent more on their mortgage than they would have been you know, six or 12 months ago. So we haven't been able to source any deals in the, in the last 12 months, uh, I think because of that mainly. Uh, so, you know, we're out there looking and hopefully Greg's right that things are gonna start to break loose soon. So, you know what, why don't you grab that mic out of there? So you can pull it out of there, we'll share this one. Oh yeah, we'll share this one. Yeah. All right. Um, so we just went to the Texas ICSC, the Red River, not too long ago, and met with all the different brokers that were there, all the top players, and asked them the same questions. You know, what did you do in 2022? And everyone had a lot of deals to talk about, like Greg was saying in 2022, great year. Uh, and then the next question was, well, what do you have to sell right now? And there were very few exceptions, but the majority of people shockingly said, we don't have anything right now, it's on the shelf. Uh, and I, I think that makes sense for a number of reasons that you know Greg and Michael have already talked about, especially with debt where it is. Um, if if you don't have to sell right now, there are very few reasons why you would want to. In my opinion, maybe you have a refi coming up, and that would be a good reason to sell. Maybe you don't want to put in the extra money that the bank's requiring you uh, to put in, and so that's going to either force you to bring in someone else or to transact. But if you don't have to, with everything, with the market going as well as it is, especially in South Florida, let's just say, I don't know why you transact unless you can get maybe a big number from one of these 1031 exchange uh, buyers. So that was Texas. Um, so Josh, is part of that because everybody is already baked in to their calculations that interest rates are going to peak at some quarter in the next year and then come down so they're thinking if we can get away with this let's just buckle up and wait to sell hold our lender off however we can and wait till interest rates peak and or come down i think everyone hopes that but no one knows so it's right. kick the can down the road hope for better times in the future when rates are lower cap rates are also lower and not where buyers um, are really pricing things there's a big spread right now that you know for an example I looked at two different deals that we did. One we did in Miami, so different markets completely, but just hear me out. So in Miami, we did a deal, 50,000 square feet, uh, great real estate, and we did that in December of 2021. Uh, our loan on that one, the interest rate was 3.7%. We just did a deal in Texas, four smaller portfolios, four 20,000 foot centers, and we bought that in December of last year, so 2022 and that rate was six and a half percent. It's almost 300 basis point difference. 
Um, our cap rate in the Miami deal was around four and a half percent. The cap rate in the Texas deals was around eight and a quarter. So, but that deal, if it had gone to the market, it would have been different. It would have been priced much differently. So there are still some sellers that need to transact, and that's where the opportunities are for, for Michael and, and myself. Uh, but those that hit the market generally are not going to be where we're going to be playing very often. So that's uh, so pretty much what we've been talking about has been um, retail, right? I was just reading in the Daily Business Review today how you know office space. It's like similar to what you said. Class A office space, killing it, going to do great. So uh, my office is in downtown Fort Lauderdale, and the the newest office building there is the main, and uh, we're going to be moving into the main, and it seems like everybody's moving into the main. So you see these office buildings that are like, you know, several blocks away from Los Olas, like one East Broward Boulevard, for instance. That building is really on the outskirts, and until Brightline does something over there, it's Siberia. I don't see how those buildings do well or survive. I don't see it. If you, what are you hearing or seeing in office at all? I mean, we pay attention to office a little bit, do smaller deals, but yeah, I mean, you're going to have to really incentivize somebody to move in. An office that, you know, Michael could probably talk about this, you know, retail, when you have smaller tenants, you can do a deal fairly quickly. Office, the cycle of moving a tenant is, is probably a, you got to be six to nine, nine months out to move a large tenant, you know? And I only know that just because we just redid our lease and plantation, we took 17,000 square feet, but I mean, we, we negotiated for like a year. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that is part of uh, what we like about the retail centers is that you can get tenants in and out fairly quickly. The TI usually isn't quite as big as you're dealing with in an office building. Uh, and right now, the, the state of the market in terms of demand for space, uh, at least with the smaller retail spaces that we deal with, is very strong. So we're able to re-tenant bays in a, in a matter of a couple months. Uh, and, and at least that part of the market is still very strong for us. I do want to make one comment, though, on what Josh was saying earlier. There, there is a reason for people to sell right now, and that's the unknown factor of where rates go. So for a lot of people that can get positive equity out of their deals that want to sell, want to take advantage of the marketplace, there's no guarantee that rates are going to go down. Yeah, true. You know, there, there just isn't. So, you know, it's, it's not you – know, those people that, that did well over the last three to five years, they were underwriting to, let's say, a – 15 or 20 IRR, and they accomplished it in a year and a half. It's not because they were magically amazing investors, it's because the interest rates went down. You know, I mean, the brokers look great because I'm selling your building for you. We're, we're, we're throwing a party for you in uh, Vegas at ICSC, and uh, we're spending millions and billions and trillions, but we, we just benefited from capital markets. I mean, I like to it tell was you. All you Greg. It, was it was all me. It was all me. It was all me. So I'll just add one. I don't know the office market that much, and so I'm not going to speak intelligently about it. Just one data point, take it for what it's worth. But we have heard of uh, different institutional groups that are selling some of their even Class A office buildings. I guess to your point, there will be some Class A office buildings that will benefit, but then there will be some where those tenants are leaving from that are still very good office buildings, but that's just a rough market, a rough. Uh, sector that I should know a lot about, but that's what I've heard. Sure. So, you know, I was just thinking about what I'm seeing as an attorney. And so I have a client that, um, he's, uh, he's a professional franchisee, right? He operates fast food and um, some casual, fast casual. And we are negotiating with landlords. And we've been negotiating with landlords for a long time. In the triple net space, it was actually pretty easy to negotiate because they're buying these properties with, you know, really cheap debt. Now that things have changed, the landlords have been tougher, but it's the strip centers for the last year. The landlords won't budge on anything. They don't <laughs> care. He's laughing. They really don't care. Like they're just, they're, they're not agreeing to rents more than three to five years out. They're trying to stick in fair market value clauses for the extensions. They're not giving extensions. It's really crazy. And I'm practicing now like 22 years. I haven't seen that. And you would have figured with COVID, if somebody would have asked me, I'll get you a second, if somebody would have asked me in the beginning of COVID, I would have said, oh, this is it, it's going down. And it went like the opposite way. Yes. And everyone talks about multifamily, like, oh man, multifamily blew up during COVID. I think retail did almost as well in a certain sense. Yeah. 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 So you had a question? 
Yeah, I was going to say, do you believe that's more of a function of supply, sort of these landlord positions? Supply, just, supply of space, or supply of like new inventory coming online. Like, do you think that for retail? Yeah, for retail it's part of it. Why landlords take this position of being? It's probably the best for you to answer. Yeah, yeah. Michael's Michael's the guy to answer. That's a good question. Well, first of all, we're landlords that care, so. <laughs> <laughs> I see one or two of my tenants in here. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But uh, it it could be that uh, the the. You know, demand right now is exceeding the supply uh, in the retail sector. Uh, but we are, like I said, we're experiencing, you know, strong demand for our space. We try to take a little more of a long term uh, look, and, you know, everything that goes up eventually comes down. So we're trying to be a little more fair when we negotiate, and we have a lot of long term tenants. So we try to uh, hold rents for existing tenants that have been in our centers. So. Uh, we do. We will give options and, and things like that, especially if a restaurant is going to come in with a with a big investment or somebody like that. You know, they're not going to do the deal if you're not willing to give them five or ten years with at least another two or three five year options. So you, you're kind of, you know, if you want to get the right tenants, you're going to have to do that. Well, you're not Bricksmore, so that's good. <laughs> yeah, you, you mentioned multifamily, and obviously you know I, this is the one of the other businesses that I spent a lot of time in. We just closed a nice deal together uh, last week. I, I think what's really driving that, that business is the debt's cheaper. And, you know, Fannie and Freddie have kept the debt cheaper. The local banks are more aggressive. And there's a much more easier, simple value add you can sell to investors. I think the other thing that's really, and, and maybe you guys can talk to this, from a capital markets perspective, I just got back from a, a National Multi Housing Council in, in Las Vegas, and 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 also work on some of these deals outside of what I typically do for brokerage. But the biggest uh, thing that I'm hearing in the marketplace, and it doesn't necessarily affect you, Michael, as much, but you can probably speak to it, is raising capital is much harder right now than it was a year ago. I mean, if you want to raise money. Uh, People, people don't have as, private guys don't have as much money as they did a year ago because the stock market got hit really hard last year. So it's, and then they, and they have higher expectations of return. So a lot of guys that are buying deals, let's use multifamily as, as an example over the last year, you know, they'll get to a closing table and all of a sudden their limited partners are, you know, maybe backing out and maybe there's not as much capital available and they're having to co-GP deals. And I don't know if that's, you know, maybe you can speak to it, Josh, or you can speak to it, Mike, a little bit, but, but capital is just getting more expensive, not just on the debt side, but on the equity side as well. Yeah. We don't really do, yeah. you know, we don't, <laughs> we don't really do much with uh, capital raises. But, uh, uh, you know, on the debt side, we work primarily with local banks that we have relationships with, uh, you know, because a lot of the deals we do because where value add buyers, they're not going to pencil out on their own. So we need a lending partner that we either have a line with or that we have additional assets with that we maybe can uh, cross collateralize with existing assets uh, in order to get deals closed. So that's that's typically how we finance. And where are you seeing rates right now with the lenders? In the high sixes, low sevens. Yeah. How about you? I was going to say five and a half to six and a half, depending on, again, life company, general bank, like we normally do banks too, uh, CMBS, it's all different. Uh, but yeah, so we're generally in that, seeing in that five and a half to six and a half percent. Uh, which would be interesting because, again, how do you, you know, that's why I asked the question earlier to Greg about these single tenant deals where they all cash, and yeah. because generally we're trying to get 200 basis points over our debt. And so if the cap rate is X, you want to be at 200 percent, you know, 2 percent after over that. So. A lot of deals just don't pencil out for us as buyers, and so we just pass on a lot of deals. We'd love to be buying more, obviously, but it just doesn't make sense. So hopefully, hopefully things correct. In the so next is that a while. rule of thumb for you? Two two hundred basis points above the debt? Yeah, it's pretty safe. Uh, yeah, it doesn't have to be, or you don't do a deal, but that's just a good rule of thumb for us on our side. Sure, sure. Uh, you know, just talking about uh, uh, debt. You know, something that. Uh, Michael and I have been talking about, I think now is a really important time to firm up relationships and open up new relationships, especially with banks and with lenders. You know, there was a particular bank that, that uh, we just closed with last week that, uh, you know, I introduced to a lot of my clients because they've done extremely well for us. 
I think if you're doing a deal right now, you really need to be able to, you know, look across the table from the person you're loaning money from and feel confident that they're going to be there for you because when you get to the 11th hour and you get those loan documents and you get those insurance requirements, you got to be able to talk through some of these issues with people. You know, insurance, we talked about insurance the other day, and insurance is a monster problem because, you know, I mean, we talked about your portfolio went up over 50%. Yeah. And, and you got to pass through a lot of that to the tenants, right? So maybe you can, maybe you can. Yeah, that's one of the, the major issues, I think, that's going to face all of uh, South Florida real estate is, is insurance. It's difficult to get, and if you can get it, it's going to be, you know, 50 to 100% higher than, than what you were paying last year. So uh, luckily... With you know most of the retail leases, we can pass that through to the tenants, uh, and you know nobody likes to have to pay it. But in the grand scheme of their total rent bill, it's it's a relatively small amount. Uh, but you know guys in uh, residential are going to feel the sting of that a lot more because you you know you can't just raise a tenant's rent mid lease because you got you got a big insurance bill. Now, just to add to that, you know, 50% would be great. I think, I mean, hear me out, because some of them, yet yeah, is 100%, sometimes it's two times. Like I've heard some other groups that are experiencing two times, maybe three times That's what they were paying. And some, That's there's no insurance at all. Sure. And so then you need to go back and talk to the lender and figure that one out. Um, and then, yeah, if you can pass it through, great, uh, right? But tenants may not be able to bear that burden. And if you do pass it on, well then, that's. At the end of the day, the tenants are just worried about what's their total rent number. And so if you're passing more insurance, more everything else to them, well, that decreases the amount of actually base rent that you can go ahead and pass on to them and increase later on. So you're, you're, there's not much you can do about it, but that's just a, a math problem. You can't uh, raise the rents as much if you're increasing everything else. So I have a client, they've been in and out of this transaction for like the last, I think it's been like six or seven months. And every time we get to a point where we're getting close, something pops up. And so what popped up on this deal is the insurance doubled from three hundred thousand to six hundred thousand dollars. And the resolution was that the seller owns a ton of real estate and has a captive. And so we're actually going to keep the seller on with a piece of equity in the deal at the number required by his captive for the insurance to, uh, for them to be able to insure the property. And so uh, that's the only way that we were able to get this deal closed. And so it just, the whole deal morphed because now I'm now negotiating an operating agreement with the seller, right? I'm negotiating with the lender to make sure that the captive is, is okay. I have, did he have to keep what percentage? 15%. But then we had to negotiate with the lender to make sure the lender didn't require him to give a guarantee on the lease, uh, on the loan. Because usually they're looking for anyone who owns more than 10%. And so we also know that this insurance game can't last forever. The seller didn't want to invest in the deal. They're selling the deal. Right. And so they're not getting the same return that they're getting when they're selling it now. So they're actually kind of taking a hit. But they're taking a hit because the market took a hit. Because they know that if they go back and relist this property, they may get several million dollars less. I mean, look at a three, you know, $300,000 over a cap rate. Yep. And the seller knows that the devil they know is better than the devil they don't know. You had a question? Yeah, I was going to ask, what's a captive? For those who don't know. So a captive is uh, it, it's an insurance company that you set up for yourself. Okay, and so like let's say I own 30 properties. It might make sense for me to set up essentially my own insurance company. But there are very specific rules around that. They're expensive to do. They're cumbersome. But I think you're going to see more of that going on now. A lot of larger clients are doing it. Yeah, a lot of the larger clients are doing it. The biggest problem with insurance, and in my mind, the insurance has gone up for two main reasons, and I want to get your opinion on this. But number one, the cost to build has skyrocketed, right? So the insurance companies realize this building comes down, we've got a shortage of contractors, and we've got a shortage of materials, maybe not so much as much now as before. And then plus the insurance companies are really upset because they're actually having to pay out. You're getting natural disasters are coming much more quickly now than they ever did before. We had a major hurricane in Florida that no one's even talking about it anymore over here. But when a major storm hit Florida and the insurance companies, 
they like to see major double digit returns and they're not getting those returns right now. And so, you know, I was not around in Florida for this, but from what I understand, after Andrew, insurance rates skyrocketed, but they eventually came down. So I wanted to know from you guys, is that going to happen again? What do you see happening? I've got my own ideas, but I've been talking for 60 seconds, so I'm going <laughs> to let you guys tell me what you think. You can go first. Yeah. Well, we hope that's what will happen, right? They'll, they'll go up temporarily, and then they'll come back down. I, I always think insurance works the opposite way. You know, I, I, if, if I was insuring and we didn't have a story for 10 years, I'd start charging you more, figuring what's coming. Uh, they wait till it comes and then charge it afterwards. Uh, but hopefully that's what will happen. I mean, we had, I think in 07 and 08, we had the same type of thing after Katrina and Wilma came through and, uh, and our rates went up two or three times. And then over the next 10 or 12 years, they slowly came back down and, and now they're, you know, they're getting that knee jerk reaction back up again. So hopefully they'll come back down. I've only been here in South Florida for about 12 years, so I haven't been through one of those, so I can't really speak intelligently about that. Go ahead, Greg. Yeah, I mean, you know, Franklin Street is, we're, we're a bigger insurance company than we are a real estate company. I don't, know if, I don't know if you know that. Our top sales guys, especially in South Florida, our top sales guys in our entire company sit in my office. Um, and it does affect us, right, because a lot of our clients get insurance from Franklin Street, and then if there's a problem, the sales guys whether we like it or not, we sometimes have to deal with it. It's like, thank God Michael doesn't get his insurance so that if something goes wrong, it's not my, it's not my company's fault, right? Um, but they are very good at it. But I, I, think, I think one of the challenges with, with, with insurance is that, you know, the insurance companies are in business to make money. And they're going to pass through that cost uh, back to the owners of the property. But what you're really dealing with, with, with which we talk about a lot with our clients, is you really need to negotiate your insurance requirements on the front end. And that's really the major issue that you're dealing with. Because if you have a loan on your property, you're encumbered by whatever those requirements are. And for example, Citizens is back heavy in the market, but you know, not every, not every lender will accept their insurance. So really just everything comes down to, um, and I think we were talking about this the other day, you know, Amherst was a big player for a long time. Now they're starting to pull out of the market. Well, they used to give you a really good insurance policy year one, then ding you in two, year two, and then kill you in year three. So it's really just a masterful game. That's why half the stadiums in America are named into different insurance companies. It's, I mean, it's literally, it's literally the biggest gimmick of all time, insurance. And I love the Franklin Street's in it because we're a secure real estate company. Our revenue's been going up. But it's the insurance guys. I These mean, are brokers, though, right? You're not insurance brokers, yeah. Well, no, no. We actually, we actually, we actually owned a insurance company that we sold this past year. Okay. So they were they were taking risk also. I mean, uh, you know, it was a separate company. So I know more about insurance than I've ever wanted to know. <laughs> but it's uh, it's definitely something as an owner and as a broker. If anybody, if any, if any guys are brokers in here, you have to be out ahead of this like early. You can't be talking about insurance once you're getting to the closing table. You've got to be dealing with this pre-listing, before you go to contract. I mean, it is, it is a major, major problem. What you're talking about is not abnormal. You know, I, I don't know that I would have done it that way by keeping the seller on board, but if that was the only way to... It was the only way. It was the only way, and that's what you got to do. How are you underwriting for insurance right now? When you see, some, you see an OM, yeah. all right? Forget about one from Marcus and Millichap, but if you see, you know, <laughs> you got a 10x that one. But well, so an off-market deal just came across my desk earlier this week, and so broker said the gross NOI was this, or gross uh, income was this, and NOI was this, and didn't really have any other information. So I had to kind of back end everything, but basically I just doubled whatever I thought um, was the the current insurance, and that really, you know lower their, their NOI, so what may have been a five cap is now like a three cap or something, just because it has such an impact. So really the way I would look at it is, okay, whatever their NOI now is, is somewhat meaningless because it's not going to be that. So if I'm valuing the income stream moving forward, I've got to use a correct insurance number, just like you would you change your real estate taxes if you're going to buy it. Now you have to also make that adjustment on the insurance side. It seems like that's the way bigger risk now than uh, interest rates, and no one's really talking about it. I watch Bloomberg every day. They don't talk about insurance. But no, they're talking about interest rates. Yeah, it's definitely 
big, and I think it's going to affect property values, and, and it's you know it's a factor in the whole market. Just a question you know, from a, me coming to you guys to rent or to a lease a property or purchase or whatever. Um, and I've never entered something like that, saying uh, or or even discussing what I see as common, you know, a two million dollar policy, three million. I've never gone and said, well. I'm going to negotiate to 1.2, or you know, from an insurance side of things, you know, insurance broker, is that even doable? Are they are there products out there that can have an, you know, like that linear adjustment? And from a owner side of things, is that even a, a, a you know conversation that you'd be willing to have? I mean, I guess you know, I guess from a you know from occupying the building standpoint, can I save money? With that approach, I've never really approached that, but I'm kind of getting that 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 that, that idea from what you're discussing. Well, I, well, I think you're you're talking about two different types of insurances, right? You're talking about the insurance that you have to pay for your business, yeah. versus yeah. the insurance that a guy like Michael has to pay for. Well, I guess that doesn't and that, liability. Isn't that, isn't that connected in in in? I don't know how it works with your tenants. They're not named in the policy. No, and that's, that's typically, I think, going to be liability. So it's, we haven't been seeing quite the same percentage increases in the liability side. It's all property. Uh, it may affect your contents coverage, which we, we'd like to see tenants insure for the full value of their contents, but we don't require it typically. So if a tenant wants to take on some risk and insure for a, a lower amount than, than what they think their contents are worth. We, we don't really check that. But we do want you to carry a, a minimum on the liability of at least, I think ours is at least two million bucks. So for the students here, so when you're, you're insuring a property, first of all, you're beholden to your lender. If your lender says this is what you have to have, you've got to, you've got to follow whatever the lender says. Now, can you negotiate with the lender? Probably, if you are you are a very strong company with really strong financials, and they know that maybe you, they can uh, lessen the insurance requirements, that's fine. But the whole idea of insurance is to mitigate your risk. So as you maybe lower the limits on the insurance or raise the deductible, the deductible is how much money you will pay out of pocket before the insurance company steps in. You're just increasing your risk and lowering the insurance company's risk so they're willing to charge you less money to insure the property. So it's just like a sliding scale, right? But at the end of the day, the lender wants to make sure that they're covered. And it's what the lender says, and that's it. And you don't have much choice. Negotiate a little, but not that much. Yeah. But insurance seems to be like the bigger issue now than ever. And I would just say that the insurance going up from a buyer's perspective might actually be good for us because there was, so I just had a meeting last week with someone who owns property and this particular property he manages for someone else. And the owner of that property has been approached before to go ahead and, and someone else purchase it, but they said they're not a seller. Well, they don't yet know because they're not the ones managing it, but they don't yet know how much their insurance is going to be going up and that should be in the next few months. And that could be a two or three X uh, increase. And that particular property has gross leases. And so they're not going to be able to pass that on to the tenants. That's going to go right against their income. So that might be something, again, just thinking about ways that anyone that's looking to buy properties, again, if someone needs to refi, okay, that might be an opportunity to go ahead and transact. Uh, but also those properties that have insurance, which is almost everyone that has going to be having their insurance increase, those might also be reasons for seller, for owners to go ahead and transact because they don't want to, uh, either they don't want to pass it all on or maybe they can't pass it on to their tenants and they'll need to figure something out. It might, might be a good time to sell. Great time to sell. Great time to sell. <laughs> Always. <laughs> Always. Yeah, if you're a broker, it's a great time to buy. It's a great time to sell. <laughs> um, any other questions from anyone in the audience? Comments? <laughs> Students, what do you guys got? My head's spinning. You're getting a good one. Your head's spinning? All right. Well, my head spins when I talk to Greg anyway, so <laughs> totally fine. Um, so, look, I feel like, you know, out of the list of stuff that we talked about, insurance, I think, definitely took up most of the time. 
and it was kind of an add-on. I was talking to somebody outside. I go, we got to talk about insurance. Oh, yeah. That's a good call. Um, but look, from what I see, uh, the transaction velocity is starting to pick up again. And at the end of last year, I was not as busy, but I am getting phone calls fast and furious right now, and th that's a good thing. We live in South Florida. It's ridiculous down here. Uh, I also was reading today about New York and California, and they are having massive net population loss. And it's funny, people from New York are going to California, which is crazy, uh, but people from California are going to Texas and to Florida, and that's propping up the market here like nowhere else. As you can tell, if you drive down to Miami from Broward on Saturday at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, it used to be like nothing. Now you're sitting in traffic. I'm like, I feel like I'm in Long Island. And we're getting to like California. We're getting like California level. There's just traffic almost all the time. But people are starting to take the bright line way more. The uptake on bright line you're going to see is tremendous. People are using the Boca station like crazy for what I'm being told. And that's too. Yeah. I would, I would say, you know, because we've got a bunch of students here, you know, anytime we do an event like this, um, a lot of people ask, like, hey, you know, what's, what's your advice for me? I'm, I'm getting into the business. You know, what should, what should I do? And so, and, I, and you guys can obviously share what you think. You know, the first thing I would tell you is find somebody that can mentor you and teach you whatever it is you want to learn. So if you want to become, you know, an owner who's going to, add value to properties and, and generate wealth over time, then you, you, you're lucky enough to be able to work in an office like Michael's and learn from him and Alex, then, then, then that's where you go and, and you go and you work for free, you, you know, even if you can work for $8 an hour, whatever the minimum wage is. If you want to become a broker, you know, come work in our office, you know, or, or, or find a good broker or somebody that's going to teach you the business. Um, if you want to learn to be a principal and learn, learn to underwrite, maybe Maybe you can get a job at Josh's group, but whatever it is, develop an expertise because if you don't have an expertise, you really can't add enough value and build enough good relationships to make you kind of living to live in South Florida because it's gotten expensive. You know, um, it's been an amazing year, but uh, you know the pressure is on. You know, when you when things go really really good. I mean, just just to kind of give you an idea, and these guys will laugh, especially Josh. You know, this is what a day goes like for a broker. So, like, you wake up, you know, in the morning, like, oh, yeah, we're going to do this deal. I'm, I'm going to contract on this, you know, $5 million deal. Then I get an email from the buyer being like, look, one of these tenants isn't paying, and uh, I want you to guarantee this, this rent for the next, you know, the next the li li life of this lease for 275000 Then the seller tells me, go to the other buyer. Forget this buyer. Then an hour later, look, I want you to work out this deal with this buyer. So this is, I literally in the parking lot, I literally was dealing with the other, the other buyer before I came in here. Just, I said to the seller, I said, look, let me just negotiate this. I will get this done for you. But like, and I said to the buyer, just send me the contract. Don't send it to anybody else. Let me review everything. Let's go over everything. And then I'll figure out how we can get this done. And that's really, I've developed that expertise over the last 20 plus years. That wasn't just waking up and figuring up how to, how to do it. I have been through hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of transactions and seen the emotions that happen between buyers and sellers. And I've learned, you know, you got to compartmentalize the negotiation, figure out how to work through this. But even I'm going through my own, you know, like, oh man, I was going to make, uh, you know, 50,000. I'm going to make nothing. <laughs> how am I going to pay for this uh, next payment on my house that I'm building? <laughs> you know, so that's what I'm going through. Like, oh shit, I got to get, I got to figure this out. I got to figure it out. So I'm just trying. So for you guys, if you want to make it in the real estate, whatever it is, leasing, tenor rep, development, whatever, develop that expertise. That, that's 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 my advice to you. Yeah, I think that's that's great advice. Uh, you know, you want to get out and experience the sector in real estate that that you are gravitating towards. And if you don't know what that is, then you maybe want to be with a bigger company where you can experience some of, you know, all of those different areas. Uh, you know, in, in our day-to-day -day world, a lot of what we do is uh, we, we basically buy older shopping centers and reposition them. Uh, so a lot of our time is spent uh, getting city approvals and dealing with the different uh, municipalities and, uh, you know, and, and just trying to work through the approvals necessary to renovate and and reposition the properties. 
Uh, you know, that's probably 50% of it, and the other 50% is finding the right tenants to come in and, and occupy the center to re either fill up vacancies or re-tenant some of the older spaces in order to, you know, add that character that we're trying to try to bring to the building because of, you know, renovating a, a building at, at the end of the day without the right tenants is just a pretty building. So it kind of goes hand in hand. You've got to have the right tenants and the right look and atmosphere of the building. Say the clients that I have that are, most, that are the most successful, they know the numbers cold. Real estate should not be an emotional purchase. If the numbers work, they work. If they kind of work, maybe you've got to craft a story to, to, to show that there's a vision for the property. But if my clients don't know the numbers cold, they're not clients for long. And it's really, it's got to be really good in math um, to, to be a really good uh, investor. Because if you don't know the math, you really don't know what you're buying and you could really make a mistake. I don't know who's woken up, uh, anybody here, you wake up in the middle of the night, you think of something that you missed, you break into that cold sweat, right? That's the worst feeling ever. And um, I watch how the sausage gets made for my clients and it, it's scary for them because that's the riskiest thing you could do. You're buying something that's, beat, that's beaten up, you have a vision for it in your head, the numbers make sense, but then you've got to go through this whole other process to make that deal work. That is, as a developer, because that's what you really are, that's one of the riskiest things you can do in business. It, it takes a lot of confidence, but if the math doesn't work or your math is wrong, it doesn't matter how good you are. Yeah, yeah I would just say really quickly uh, to the students, so one thing that I'm grateful for is the different, it's perspectives, so it's the different seats at the table that I've been able to, to sit in. So I started off as a very private company, entrepreneurial, and they do things very differently than a very publicly traded company, which I went to work for next. And then I had a different role. So I was doing acquisitions before here, and then asset management here. And then I went to work for brokerage, doing what Greg is doing, investment sales of retail shopping centers. And so I sat at a different seat of the table, and then I went back to the principal side. And so just being able to, to understand what the other people on the other side of the table are thinking is helpful in transactions, because you've been there, you know what they're experiencing, and, and that, that should help you. And then also, at these different places, whether you work at a very public company, you may be focused on one thing because it's so big. You just have this one responsibility. But at a smaller company, like Genora or Global or others, you probably have to wear a lot of different hats, and that's good. You, you learn a lot, get a lot of exposure, doing a lot of different things, and you're not maybe pigeonholed in one particular type of thing. All right, so uh, I think we hit everything that I wanted to talk yeah, about and uh, want to thank you guys for everything. And if uh, you have questions, feel free to chat with any of us here. I'll be happy to talk to you about it and good luck with everything. And uh, thanks so much, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you. Well, 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 good to see you. All right. Now we, now we got to do, do it.